Good morning, everyone. Uh, give me a few minutes and got a, a couple people um, still yet to sign in. So we'll give just a few more minutes and we'll get started. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. If people come in, they come in. If not, they don't. So, uh, we're, my name is John Pendleton. I'm the uh, obviously the trainer here at Intertech, and we're going to be covering the heat of extraction, heat of rejection calculations. Uh, you know how to take the readings and where to find the information in the IOMs. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been with Intertech for about eight and a half years now, and uh, I, I was I work in technical support. That's where I started at was in technical support, uh, answering phone calls, handling handling a lot of warranties, uh, did a lot of site visits and uh, a big uh, commissioning of units and stuff. My, my background is I, I grew up in the industry. My dad was in the industry. My grandfather was in the industry. I swore I'd never be in the industry and uh, yet here I am. So. Uh, Went to college, came back, couldn't really find a job. And so I went to the trades. It uh, just kind of came naturally to me. So I was a service technician for a long time. I did go back to school and went through an apprenticeship program. And uh, once I got out of that, I worked on a lot more uh, commercial chillers and boilers, uh, a lot of factory work, that type of thing. So I've got a pretty well-rounded knowledge and I've been in the field quite a bit, uh, at least 20 years in the field. So. Um, I've got a lot of experience and I try to relate some of that to my trainings. Um, I'm a very visual learner, um, which I think a lot of technicians are. Uh, so I try to bring a little bit of that in with me. Uh, unfortunately, with the with the with the uh, pandemic and all that, we don't have a whole lot of in-person trainings right now. But when we do, uh, we bring in some hands-on trainings, bring some units in and actually work on units. So. Uh, if you need anything at the end, my contact information is there. This webinar is recorded and it will, will be uploaded to our YouTube channel uh, later on today. So if you want to go back and watch it or you can check out our YouTube channel and we record all the webinars. So all the trainings are there if you want to check them out. Our YouTube channel is Intertech University. So definitely check it out. <clears throat> With that said, we will go ahead and uh, get started today. There's uh, my little ugly mug there. There's my email. I'll have it at the end as well. Uh, this 618-690-3275 is my direct line. It'll ring directly to my desk. Uh, if you just need technical support, you can call the 664-5860 number, and that will ring directly back to tech, tech support. Uh, and then there is my email address as well, john.pendleton at intertechgeo.com. This is our technical support team. Now we have added uh, another gentleman. I haven't put his picture in here yet because um, he hasn't been in the office for me to take his picture. Uh, and then we've also uh, rehired, We, if you've 
dealt with us in the past. Uh, we had a gentleman in tech support named Kern Wildhaber, and he's coming back to us. And he'll be back with us in May. So um, right now it's a little bit stressful for us in tech support because I'm gone quite a bit, and that doesn't leave very many guys back there. So we definitely needed a little bit of hand, and uh, I'm glad we, we were able to get that. Allows me to kind of focus on some training and site visits a little bit more. Again, direct line tech support. It'll ring to all of us. Uh, most of us work eight to five. Rob Shawless is out of Pennsylvania, so he's on Eastern time. So he works seven to 4 p.m. And Kip is in Wisconsin and Jim Strandlin is in Minnesota. And I'm here in uh, Greenville, Illinois. But if you don't know where Greenville, Illinois is, we're closer to Chicago, or, uh, St. Louis than we are Chicago. We're about an hour east of St. Louis. We do have an after hours phone line that we pass the phone around to each of us. So if you need assistance, uh, you know, away from the 8 to 5 p.m. at 618-267-1768 is the cell phone that will ring to us. And uh, we'll do our best to help you. We're not sitting in front of the computer when you call. Uh, so we'll, we can always pull up a IOM or something for you. Um, but we may not have some of the, the older equipment IOMs. So, but we usually know our product pretty well and we'll definitely you know, be able to assist you uh, to a certain extent. I'm not gonna lie, if you call on that after hours phone like 2 a.m., uh, we're probably not going to answer it because we're probably going to be asleep. So on to the heat of extraction and heat of rejection. Uh, basically, the calculation is no different when you're going from one mode to the other. Uh, we're still doing the same calculations. Uh, we're just either extracting from the loop field or we're rejecting to the loop field, and that's, that's heat. No refrigerant gauges are needed verifies equipment performance by measuring the amount of heat that's either being rejected or extracted from the loop field. So you're gonna need a water pressure gauge with a needle. Uh, I would recommend a digital pressure gauge and a thermometer to go into the pressure temperature port so that we can check the temperature difference. Uh, I would recommend again, a digital thermometer. Uh, I've got a picture here of one I'll show you here in just a minute. And it's, got, it's made by Cooper. And it's got a tapered end on it, so it goes into your pressure temperature or your PT ports a lot easier. Basically, once you get the numbers, uh, we'll show you how to look in the factory catalog and compare the numbers. And we've got to have PT ports in the unit. So pressure temperature ports have to be in the unit. If you've got a water-to-water -water unit, then we need them on the load side as well. Um, it makes it difficult on a pressurized flow center to establish water flow if we don't have pressure temperature ports. We'll always check the unit running in second stage, and if it has a desuperheater, we'll turn that off. We do have some running numbers of units in first stage, but we would recommend that you uh, go ahead and put it into your second stage. Understanding, understanding the engineering data tables. In our industry, the IOMs are usually pretty consistent as far as uh, the information that's listed. It may be, the, the look of it may be a little bit different, but most manufacturers were all um, uh, pretty much on a, on, a, on a set standard of how we uh, handle these charts. This is a chart in the IOM this is a little bit older one, uh, maybe out of a old XT unit or something. But um, And so it kind of jumps around a little bit from this 30 degree water temperature to the 50. Our newer IOMs will give, we start at 25 and we go to 30 and then we go 35 to 40 and then we do it in 10 degree increments. So we can get a little, little bit closer for you. If for some reason you're in the middle of let's say 30 to 50, then you'd have to kind of extrapolate some information. And we do have some correction factors in the IOM. To be honest, I've never used the correction factors in the IOM um, because the calculations usually will come out pretty close to where you need them to be, or they'll be really far off. 
uh, so you'll realize there's a problem. So we need to understand <clears throat> the information listed here. So, you know, we've got these breakouts and it's telling you what EWT means. When, you, when you're looking at the IOM, it's not going to tell you. It's going to say EWT. Well, the EWT is the entering water temperature on your source heat exchanger. You got water coming in uh, from the loop field. So you have a PT port there, um, and that's your entering water temperature. That gives us kind of a, a base starting point of where we start this heat of extraction. The next thing is listed as flow rate, and that's showing in GPM. So that's showing how many GPMs are going through this heat exchanger in one minute. Now, we do list three different flow rates. So don't just say, well, we should be moving seven GPM. So that's what I'm going to use. The next spot on this chart is WPD, which is water pressure drop. And we have it listed in PSI and theta head. If you take PSI, at, let's say this 1.8 here, and you multiply it by 2.31, that gives us our feet ahead. We use the feet ahead for sizing of pumps. So when you're looking at your loop field and you're trying to figure out what flow center you need, you can look in this IOM and it'll tell you what the pressure drop of the heat exchanger in the unit is. So this 4.2 feet ahead is, is the, what we have to overcome when we're pumping. 1.8 is the pressure drop that will equal that feet ahead, but 1.8 is what we would look at with our pressure gauge. We got a quick question here. Oh, you know, I, I totally apologize for that. I, uh, I don't think I unpaused it. So hang on one second here. <laughs> that probably wouldn't be the first time I've done that. Totally apologize for that, guys. You should be able to uh, see it now. <laughs> Probably makes it a little bit easier for the training if you can actually see the slides, huh? <laughs> I'll definitely, I'll, I'll go back. Yep, that's not a problem, Jerry. There's my little ugly mug there. We're gonna start back over again. I, again, I apologize for that. <laughs> Got a little ahead of myself there. Again, this is my contact information. Uh, I'll have it again at the end of the presentation. And if, if you want a copy of this presentation as well, a PDF, just shoot me an email and I'll give you the PDF of the training as well. This is our tech support team again. You can see Rob, Pennsylvania. I'm out of Greenville. Kip is in Wisconsin, and Jim is in Minnesota. Kern uh, Wildhaber, he'll be working out of the Greenville office. And we have uh, Dave Pergel, and he's kind of handling some of our Canadian stuff. And he actually, I think he lives in Michigan, but right uh, in the UP. So he's going to be handling some of our Canadian stuff as soon as he can get across the border again. Direct line to tech support, it'll ring to all of us and whoever's the first available will get it. You can always ask for a certain technician. You know, if you've been working with Rob on a project, uh, you can ask for him and we'll transfer you over there as long as he's available. Um, so if you wanna talk to a certain person, feel free to ask. Do you have an email address? So if you wanna send in any type of pictures or you got a unit startup form you want us to take a look at or a troubleshooting form, uh, you can email it into tech support. If you got pictures you want us to take a look at, uh, you can email them into tech support. And again, that's a group email. Again, no refrigerant gauges needed in heat of extraction, heat of rejection. You can leave those on your truck until you realize you need them. Uh, with a closed sealed system, Every time you put refrigerant gauges on there, you're gonna take a little bit of refrigerant out. So uh, we wanna make sure that we don't have to, that we don't put the refrigerant gauges on if we don't need to. 
So you'll need a water pressure gauge with a needle to insert into the pressure temperature ports. You'll need a digital and a digital thermometer and also the uh, the specs from the IOM. Make sure you always install pressure temperature ports. Again, make sure you install them on the, uh, you've got a water to water unit that you install them on the load and the source. Data tables, again, this is uh, probably from an older XT unit or something, uh, but it'll have a lot of headings on top. The EWT is your entering water temperature. And again, that's the entering on your source. Your flow rate, uh, it's listed in GPM, and don't just pick the amount of GPM that you think it should have. Uh, we've actually got to use the pressure drop in order to figure out what the GPM is. Now, I don't have, if you call and tell me, you know, I, I have a four pound pressure drop, what is the GPM? Without model or serial number, I can't really tell you. There, I don't have a, a calculation or a mathematical equation to say if I have this GPM and this temperature, what's the flow rate? Uh, it's gonna vary by unit uh, due to the different heat exchangers that are in it and, uh, and that kind of thing. This feet ahead uh, is calculated by taking the PSI times 2.31, and we use this feet ahead when we're sizing pumps for the flow center. On the unit, that's the pressure draw, or that's the feet ahead uh, through the heat exchanger and through the unit, basically. So again, GPM is just that: how many gallons per minute we're moving through the heat exchanger. So water pressure drop, we can test water pressure drop. You know, we can take go to the heat exchanger, put a pressure gauge in the entering, put a pressure gauge in the leaving and do the math and you'll get a pressure difference or a delta P. We used to see delta T, well, this is delta P. A little pressure difference. <clears throat> Again, water pressure drop, uh, excuse me, entering air temperature is the return air temperature on the unit. So we have 60, 70 and 80 listed there. If you, again, if your numbers are outside of that, you got 75 uh, return air temp or 65 return air temp. We do have a correction factor in the IOM. Uh, in my eight and a half years at Intertech, I don't know if I've ever used the correction factor. Uh, usually it'll work out pretty closely. Uh, it's right on the line. You may want to use it, but usually you're going to be able to tell pretty easily if the heat of extraction or the heat of rejection is um, it is is correct. So again, if it's sixty five, this is the correction factor that's in the IOM. So we'll list a little bit of different entering air temperatures and things. Normally for AHRI. They use 80, um, 80 for cooling on the return and 68 in heating. So heating capacity, if you actually look at this little yellow graph or yellow box here, you'll see that we have HE, that's heat of extraction. Then we have HC, heating capacity. You can see that you know here it's showing 30,200 for your heating capacity and our heat of extraction to 21,000. So we've got a total heating capacity, what's delivered to the unit, to the home, and then we have what, what we're taking out of loop fuel. You might ask yourself, why is the, where are we getting that extra heat from? That extra heat is from your heat of compression. So here is a good example here. It's a pretty easy breakdown, but we've got 30,000 that we're pulling from the loop field. And then we've got what's called heat of compression. And that's the, the heat that's generated by, by uh, producing the energy that's going into the home with the compressor. So your compressor com produces heat and we got to do something with it. So in heating mode, we're fortunate, we can pick up that heat and we can send it into the home. You can actually figure out how many BTUs 
the compressor is generating, um, you can take volts times amps, and that equals watts. It's easy to check volts and amps when you're at the unit. So you can see how much the compressor is producing. Volts times amps equals watts. And you know that's watts, not BTU. So you take uh, that and you multiply it by, um, I think it's 2.3. Can't remember off the top of my head, but, um, and that'll give you your BTUs. And then that'll be added to your heat of extraction. Um, and so that'll give you your total heating capacity. With your total heating capacity, you can also figure out the efficiency of the unit as well. We'll cover that here in just a minute. Heat of extraction, again, that's just what we're pulling out of the loop field. That's what we're measuring uh, with our uh, pressure drop and our temperature difference. Leading air temp, that's your supply air temperature. That's what it should be pretty close to if we're moving uh, 1200 CFM. In the newer IOMs, we do have different CFM levels listed, so it'll kind of break it out for you. Uh, here, we only have one CFM listed, which is in the top here at uh, 1200 CFM. The uh, next is your input. That's your power from the uh, compressor. So that's volts times amps equals watts. Again, that's your heat of compression or the, the uh, energy used for the compressor. Now, coefficient of performance, that's the efficiency of the unit. That's where we should be. That's what the lab tested it at. This is a good uh, calculation if the homeowner ever complains about high utility bills and they blame the geothermal unit uh, because we have a COP listed and with volts times amps, you can figure out what the COP of the unit actually is. You can compare it with what, you know, if we're pulling a, a 3.0 and it's calling for a 3.5, then there must be an issue uh, with the compressor. So again, COP, coefficient of performance, is energy delivered divided by the energy supplied to deliver that energy. So here we've got our energy delivered to the home is 40,000 BTUs, and it's supplied by the 10,000 that we've listed here for the compressor. So we take the 40,000 divided by our 10,000, and that gives us a 4.0 COP. It's a good thing to keep in your back pocket. Um, we don't use the calculation a lot, but when a homeowner starts to complain about high bills, uh, we can look at the unit and see if it is the problem. If it's not, it's a good calculation to show the homeowner and say, you know, this is what it's doing. Uh, this is what the IOM says. It, we can't do any better than that. So here is a little uh, chart here of showing if we took this kilowatts and converted it to BTUs, and we did the math, we would end up with this 3.58. Now, if we have a little bit higher, we may not be reading something quite properly. If we had that 4.0, um, maybe we're not running in second stage or something. Maybe we're stuck in first stage, so we don't, we're not pulling those amps. In cooling, we use HR, uh, heat of rejection. And uh, this TC is your... Um, total cooling capacity. So your cooling capacity from the home is going to be lower than your heat of rejection. And again, due to that heat of compression. In cooling mode, we still have that heat from the compressor that we have to do something with. So we pick it up and we put it in the loop field. That's why your heat of rejection is always higher than your heat of extraction. The calculation that we're doing for heat of rejection or heat of extraction is the same, but the number should be higher in cooling than it is in heating because we're doing some, we got to move that heat of compression uh, out to the loop field. 
So how do we perform the measurements and the calculations? Before a system can properly be diagnosed or serviced, you gotta make sure we have water flow and if it's a, a blower motor bearing unit that it has airflow as well. If it's a water to water unit, we need to make sure that we have flow, water flow on the load side as well. Obviously the compressor is not gonna operate properly if we don't have water flow or we don't have airflow. So it's a pretty quick, easy way to check. Water flow is a little bit more difficult because we gotta use pressure drop. Airflow, you can usually see it or hear it, I mean, and you can also look at the ECM board and count the flashes on it and it'll tell you how many CFM it's moving. These are the, these are the tools that I would recommend. This is a digital pressure gauge made by Dwyer. Uh, we do sell it at Intertech. You can also purchase it online. You purchase it online, uh, make sure that you get the needle as well to go into the pressure temperature port. If you order one from Intertech, customer service is usually pretty good about asking you. And we've got the needles that are real thin, uh, so they go into the PT ports a lot better. If you buy one of those needles at the hardware store, a lot of times they're real thick. And so they don't really want to go into the into the PT port very easily. Now I'd recommend a digital uh, temperature gauge as well. This one on top, we used to hand these out. Uh, they had kind of a bigger shaft and sometimes it would get stuck in the PT port. So we found this Cooper thermometer and you can see it's got a tapered end on it and it really slides into that PT port quite nicely. Uh, we do sell the Cooper uh, thermometer as well. I don't know, 20, 30 bucks. I think this Dwyer gauge we sell for maybe 160, um, but I would imagine you might be able to find it on Amazon or something cheaper. Not really sure, but um, these are the tools I'd recommend. We have some small units, half ton, and they'll have you know half pound pressure drop, maybe one pound at the most, and so that's really hard to see on a on an analog like dial gauge. So that's why we do recommend the um, digital pressure gauge. PT ports, they're super important. If, you, if they don't install them you know, on, initial, on initial installation, there's no way to establish water flow on a pressurized system. Uh, the only way to do it is to disconnect one of the lines and drain it into a five gallon bucket and see how long it takes. And that's really not a good way of going about doing it. So when in doubt, install pressure temperature ports. We have hose kits that the fittings that are at the unit will come with them. Uh, so I would always recommend to get those fittings with the pressure temperature port with them. If you have a non-pressurized flow center, then we will need to use a um, flow meter tool. You can leave it in the system. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. Uh, over, if you worked on a lot of boilers and chillers and water systems in general, over time, you're not gonna be able to see through it. So it's just gonna kind of waste it away and give another spot for a leak. So I would just, once you get the flow set on initial startup, it's not gonna change. Uh, so just get it set and then you can remove the flow meter tool. With the newer NP series, uh, non-pressurized flow centers from GeoFlow, we can usually get pressure drop on those. They're usually accurate now. We have the QT, the older white cabinet, uh, non-pressurized flow center, and that is not accurate on pressure drop. It will kind of let us know that we have water flow, just not really uh, what the water flow is. So here's the calculation for the heat of extraction or heat of rejection. It's basically your temperature difference times your GPM times your brine factor. So temperature difference is just that. It's the difference between your entering and leaving water. GPM is the pressure difference between the entering and leaving. And then you look in the IOM and compare that number and get your GPM. We'll go through a IOM here and uh, we'll go through some practice exercises together and, 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 do, and look at the IOMs and see what we got. 
Brine factor, it's found by multiplying the weight of the fluid times 60 minutes in an hour. Um, just use 500 if you have straight water. So if you have an open loop or you're in the Caribbean or somewhere where you're not worried about the water dropping below 30 degrees. Uh, if it's got antifreeze in it, we'll use 485. This is actually the exact capacity factors of different antifreezes and their levels um, that you could use, but just for an e ease of remembering and, and everything, 485 for antifreeze, 500 for, for pure water. In the IOM, you, did, you may have noticed that we do list three uh, flow rates. So at this 30 degree mark, we have six, nine, and 12, but we can't just like pick one and go, well, we should be at 12 because it's a four, 10 unit. Uh, that's where we have to use our pressure drop. So the first flow rate that we have represented here is the minimum flow rate recommended for an open loop. The minimum flow rate that is recommended on an open loop is one and a half GPM per ton. So if this is a four ton unit, one and a half GPM per ton would be six GPM. Our next flow rate is the minimum flow rate for a closed loop system. So the minimum flow rate for a closed loop system is 2.25 GPM per ton. So if you can get 2.25 out of your single pump flow center on a YTO48, then you're okay. That's the minimum flow rate. And then we have our recommended flow rate for a closed loop, which is 3 GPM per ton. So here we've got a YTO48, we had pressure in of 40.8 and a pressure out of 36. So that will give us, we just do the math on that, a 4.8 pound pressure drop. So if we look at that chart in the IOM, we looked at the 4.8. So we go to the PSI pressure drop, and we'll just tell you it's 30 degree entering water. So go to 4.8 and that'll tell us that we are moving 12 GPM. If you have a PSI out, obviously that's higher than your PSI in, then the flow is going in the wrong direction. Uh, there are, there's normally stickers on the unit, and I have seen the stickers put on wrong before at the factory. We've, we've addressed that issue. Uh, it wasn't like a rash of stuff. It was maybe a new employee or something, but when that happened, uh, we kind of realized it and we made some changes to how we process uh, the stickers and things in the factory. So hopefully we won't have that problem again, but normally it's due to we put the sticker on wrong because there are uh, labels and they normally will hook them up correctly in the field. If there's ever a doubt of if the sticker is on right or wrong, either call us in tech support or look in the IOM at the unit uh, layout and it'll tell you the correct uh, location of your uh, source water in and your source water out, as well as your, if it's a water to water unit, your load in and, and your load out. Again, pressure difference, you take pressure in, pressure out, and do the math. Here we got 3.4 pound pressure drop. If we looked in our chart, 30 GPM or 30 entering water temperature, the 3.4 would actually equal our 7 GPM. So that would be would be minimum flow rate on a closed loop system. Calculating temperature difference, I'm sure you, you've probably done air side many times, uh, you know, checking across the air coil to see what the temperature difference is on that. Well, it's really no different here, except for checking water temperature. So entering water at 36.8 and leaving at 31.2, you know, that we just do the math on that and it gives us a 5.6 degree temperature difference. We can also look at the temperatures of the water. So if it's 36.8 in and 31.2 out, then we're extracting heat. So we're in heating mode. If we had 31 in and 36 out, then we're rejecting heat to the loop field. So we would be in cooling mode.
So here's an example of an XT, so a packaged uh, forced air uh, four ton unit on a closed loop. If we have a pressure drop or we've got a temperature in of 52.1 and we're leaving at 44.9, that would tell us that we're in heating mode. So we're picking up heat and taking it to the unit, so we're leaving at a lower water temperature than what we're coming in at. Entering water pressure of 52.4, leaving at 47.6, so we got a 4.8 pound pressure drop. When we looked at that chart earlier, it told us it was 12 GPM, so that's the number we're going to use. So now we can just do the math. 7.2 temperature difference times our GPM of 12, and we have, I'm going to just tell you an antifreeze in the system that's a closed loop. So our brine factor is 485. If we do the math on that, it's 41,904 BTUs. And really, that's just a number. It's just a number until we compare it to the IOM. You know, we'd look at the closest water temperature in the IOM, 452 degrees would be 50. And so we look at 50 degree entering, 12 GPM, 70 degree. Uh, entering air temperature, and it tells us that the manual, in the manual, that we should be at 40,100 BTUs. As long as we're within 10% of what the book says, then there's no reason to do anything else. The unit's doing all that it can. Normally, we don't see above the heat of extraction or rejection, unless maybe we're not really moving 12 GPM, maybe we're moving 11 and a half, or something like that, I'll throw it off a little bit. But as long as we're you know, above it or within 10% of this 40,100, then we're good to go. Don't put your refrigerant gauges on there. Um, there's, there's no need for it. The unit can't do anything else than what it's doing. So basically, you know, it tells you how the unit's performing real quickly. You know, it's a calculation that I would run on every single unit, no matter why I was there. It's just so easy to do. And the more you do it, the more comfortable you get reading our IOMs and how to get the calculation. So the more practice you do, the better you get. And if you ever forget how to do the calculation, if you can get the information, the pressure drop and the temperature difference, you can call us and tech support. I mean, we do it numerous times a day and uh, we can do it for you real quickly. We can pull up the IOM if you don't have an IOM. You know, give us a call. We've got all those. We'll look it up for you. And if there is a problem, you know, we'll, we'll help you uh, along that way too. So, uh, again, if you if you forget, just give us a call with as much information as possible. Especially uh, when you do call in tech support, if you make sure that you have the serial number of the unit, uh, the model number we can get if you have the serial number. Uh, but one thing that's nice about the serial serial number is that we can look up any history on the unit. Uh, we can also look and see if there's any recalls or uh, upgrades on the unit, um, you know, and if there's been warranties applied to the unit, that kind of thing. So if you've called into tech support and talked to us about that unit in the past, or if another technician has, we'll have a record as long as they called in with that serial number. So we can give a little bit of history of the unit itself. So, uh, we're going to go through a few practice exercises here real quick uh, before we uh, wrap up. So in this example, we're going to assume that we're at 1600 CFM on a YT-048 and we're in second stage. We're telling you that the brine in it is methanol, um, so we know that it's a closed loop system. So the first thing we're going to do is check our water pressure. And to be honest, if you have your temperature gauge in your hand first, um, I'm fine with that. Uh, it doesn't really matter to me too much if you have, um, if you're checking water pressure first or temperature first. So entering water pressure of 49 and we're leaving at 46. So we did, that's pretty easy to do the math on that. We have a three, three pound pressure drop. That's not GPM, that's just pressure drop. Next, we'll look at our entering water temperature of 53 and a half, and we're leaving at 44.6. So if we look at this, our entering water is higher than our leaving water, so we're in heating mode. 
Do the math on that, and we got an 8.9 degree temperature difference. So I told you again, since we have a higher entering than leaving, we're in heating mode. Anytime we have a brine in the system, we'll use 485. So we have methanol 485 and a pressure drop of three. We also need to look at our entering water temperature and kind of remember it for a second because we're going to have to look at the IOM. So 53, probably the closest temperature we're going to have is going to be 50 degrees. So here's the chart for the IOM. 50 degrees will be the closest. So 50 degree entering water, we had a PSI pressure drop of three. So 2.9 is pretty close. So we slide over and that tells us we have nine GPM. So that's minimum flow rate on a closed loop system. So now we know we have nine GPM. Our temperature difference was almost nine, 8.9. So now we have all the numbers we need in order to uh, complete the calculation. So again, GPM, temperature difference, brine factor. We just do the math on that. Multiply all those together, and we come up with 38,848 BTUs. Again, it's just a number uh, until we look at the IOM. So we'll have to write down that 38.8, and we'll look up in the spec book again back to the 50 degree entering water 9 gpm and see here we are listing two cfm levels 1600 and 1790 uh, and it we told you it was 1600 so now we go to our he which is heat of extraction not our hc he and follow that down that tells us 39.6. That's 39,600 BTUs. So we'll remember that number. We measured 38.8. Catalog spec for 39.6. So as long as we're within 10% of 39,600, which that would be about 35,600 BTUs, somewhere right around there. Um, on the low end. So we're above that 36,000 BTUs minimum. Um, so we are within 10%. So yes, the unit is operating properly. We'll go through another one here. Here we've got a five ton packaged XT unit and we're at 1950 CFM. And our brine factor is just straight water. So, um, no antifreeze in the system. We check our water pressure, 23 and a half in, 21 out. So that's a two and a half pound pressure drop. You can see how some of these pressure drops are kind of small and they would be hard to see on a dial gauge. Te check our water temperature, 48.7 in, and we're leaving at 67.9. So here, our water temperature is lower entering than it is leaving. So we're picking up heat from the home and we're rejecting it to the loop field. So we're in cooling mode. And we have a 19.2 degree temperature difference. <clears throat> so we're, uh, we're in cooling mode. The brine factor for water is 500. We had a pressure drop of 2.5 and entering water of 48.7. So we'll look at the IOM, 50 degrees is gonna be the closest water temperature. We had a PSI pressure drop of two and a half pounds. So that tells us we're moving to seven and a half GPM, which is the recommended flow rate for an open loop system. So now we know our GPM, we know our Delta T, we can basically just uh, complete the calculation. So our GPM and our temperature difference and our brine factor. Multiply those together. That gives us 72,000 BTUs. Again, just a number until we compare it. 
So we'll look in the IOM again, 50 degree, seven and a half GPM, 1950 CFM. That's 80,400 BTUs. So we measured 72. Catalog specs for 80,400. Are we within 10%? Yes, but just barely. We're at it by about 40 BTUs. So on something like this, when you see, you know, yeah, we are within 10%, the unit can't do a whole lot more than that. You may want to ask yourself, why are you there? You know, are you there because just for preventative maintenance? Or are you there because the unit's not keeping up? Um, I would hope that you're there just for maintenance. If you're there because it's not keeping up, they really size this home really tight. Uh, and you may look and uh, see that maybe the TXV is not really throttling properly or something like that. You're really going to have to take this example on a case by case basis. Because yes, it is within 10%, but you know, why are you there? If you're just there for maintenance, make sure to make a note on your ticket that to check it again in six months, make sure it hasn't fallen off even further uh, where we might notice that there is a problem. But it is operating properly, just barely. So again, just consider why, why you are there. Here's one more exercise. I think it's the last one. Uh, here we've got a three-ton unit, 1,240 CFM, and uh, we've got glycol in the system. Entering water pressure 18, leaving at 15. That's pretty easy uh, to do the math on that. We got a three pound pressure drop. Entering water temperature at 30, and we're leaving at 26.9. So we're in heating mode because our entering water temperature is higher than what our leaving water temperature is. And we're only getting about a 3.2 degree temperature difference. Once you start to do heat of extraction, heat of rejection more and more, you'll start to notice this temperature difference number and what a range of what a normal would be. And you'll prob you'd probably say, hey, this 3.2 seems kind of low unless we've got lots of water flow. Uh, so you might start to see things that jump out at you the more and more you do this calculation. So we know that we're in heating mode. Brine factor for anything with antifreeze in it is 485. We had a pressure drop of three and an entering water temperature of 30. So we look at the IOM, we go to 30 degree and 3.2 is pretty close. So we're at nine GPM. Now that we know our GPM and we have our Delta T, our temperature difference, we can do the math. So we take our nine GPM times our temperature difference of 3.2 times our brine factor of 485, and that gives us 13,968 BTUs. So we'll compare that to the IOM. Again, we are at 39 GPM and 1240 CFM. So we come to the heat of extraction, HE. So we should be at 22,000. 700 BTUs, that's what 22.7 means. So we measured 13.9, catalog specs at 22. Are we within 10%? Definitely not. Um, so we would have to dig in deeper and find out. Now, with this example, I would look and say, okay, we're running about two-thirds capacity. Um, this unit is a two-stage unit. Is the unit shifting the second stage? Uh, our compressors, when they run in first stage, they run at 67%. So this might be a case of maybe the Y2 uh, doesn't have power to it, or maybe there's something wrong with a solenoid on the compressor. But always check things that you think might be wrong with the unit that are not refrigerant related first before you put your refrigerant gauges on there. But this is just you know an example I can bring up because it's something that 
know, at, over time and working with equipment that you'll start to realize, hey, that's two thirds capacity. I wonder if it's upstaging. Um, so heat of extraction is the first diagnostic tool that we should be using on all equipment. Uh, but again, make sure you have airflow and water flow first because we can't expect those calculations to be proper until we the, that those are those two flows are established. Again, we do have a YouTube video on the heat of extraction, heat of rejection, uh, and this will also be recorded today. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Again, here's the contact information for technical support, uh, the email address, as well as my email address. And if you need to uh, contact me, my direct line is area code 618-664, or excuse me, 618-690-3275. Again, my direct line is 618-690-3275. Uh, if there's any other training that you would like for your company, uh, webinar based or something, you know, feel free to reach out. Uh, if you've got questions on any upcoming trainings, or anything, you know, don't ever hesitate um, to reach out to me. Hopefully here soon. Um, I'm hoping maybe May I will start back in-person training. So um, you can keep that in mind for uh, you dealers out there. If you're close to here or if you would like me to travel, I do travel for trainings as well. Uh, if you have a TM, uh, contact him as well. Uh, if you're dealer direct, you can just come to me and we'll figure something out. So with that, that's all I have for today. And uh, thanks for joining. I apologize for the little bit of technical uh, difficulties this morning. Sometimes I'm computer illiterate. So uh, I'm more of a service technician than a computer wizard. So uh, again, thanks again for joining today and uh, have a wonderful week.